This is by far the best vodka I've ever made. It's made with barley, unmalted barley, wheat, distilled on eight plates. And I'm going to show you exactly how I made it right after I drink this. Cheers, guys. Hmm. How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, and this is Still It. And today we are making a vodka. It's made with a barley, wheat, and yes, a little bit of sugar. Now, the reason I decided to do this is uh, I've had the pleasure of sampling some vodkas that are just straight up, hands down, better than what I've made in the past. I've also tried uh, a fair few vodkas that are made predominantly with sugar. Some of them, like Teddy Sad's Fast Fermenting Vodka, have, you know, uh, grain thrown into basically flavor it and add nutrients for the yeast, but I've tried very few vodkas that are made from scratch with grain. So in an attempt to improve my vodka game, I decided to make a vodka that was primarily all grain. Obviously there's a whole host of grains out there that you could choose from, but I decided to settle on unmalted barley and wheat. Oh, and of course, I've never personally distilled anything with more than four plates. So today, I decided to up the ante and go straight up to eight. So uh, we're trying a bunch of new stuff today, guys. And spoiler, it turned out really well. Let's not mess around. We'll get straight on into the mash. And before the ingredients, we're going to talk about a little bit of a concept on the way I'm going to do this. And that is the idea of not measuring everything precisely. The last time I mashed grain was to make the love child to fill the barrel. You can check that video out after this one if you want. And the way I went through it and the process made me realize that in some ways I think that people get hung up too much on exact recipes rather than just kind of going through the process and realizing it's not that scary. Don't get me wrong, recipes and exact recipes are wonderful for repeatability, for recipe development, so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, you can just make stuff and it's going to be pretty good without them. <laughs> With that being said, here's how I went about making this recipe. The first ingredient, and the largest by volume, is wheat. This is feed store wheat, it's not malted, it's not torrefied, uh, it's not steam rolled or anything like that, it's just straight up wheat. <laughs> so it needs to be crushed, I put it through the mill, and we're going to cook it later on. The second ingredient is unmalted barley. Now once again, this isn't gelatinized or crushed, so we need to do both of those things. I'm using roughly 13 kilos of this stuff. Once again, it went through the mill and mixed in with the wheat. Oh, and guys, don't stress, the entire recipe is going to be in the description down below, in metric, and of course freedom units as well. The first step is to fill a dirty great big pot up to just below the halfway mark. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is it's going to give us a decent ratio of grain to water going forward uh, and fill it on up with boiling water. Once it's filled up and you give it a really good stir to make sure there's no dough balls, there's nothing sticking, everything's broken up well, uh, you can start heating it and bring it up to a boil. On the way up to a boil, I would suggest adding a small amount of high temperature alpha amylase. We're going to be using this stuff later on for the mash itself. Adding a little bit in now just means that you don't have to deal with porridge <laughs> while we're cooking it. It's going to help it thin it out a little bit. I'm heating this pot with gas and that's what I prefer for this sort of thing. Unfortunately my gas burner doesn't burn clean. It is what it is, but that is something I do need to upgrade because it is a bit of a pain in the butt. Anyway, keep stirring and we're going to cook this stuff for half an hour. Once it's cooked for half an hour, dump it all into the fermenter. I'm using a 100 litre fermenter that actually holds more like 130 litres. Uh, anyway, get all of the cooked grain into the fermenter, cover it up, insulate it and repeat the entire process for as many times as you need to to get all of the grain cooked and into the fermenter. Obviously we're all here because we love spirits but if you're like me sometimes you can just get a little bit burnt out and you want to drink something different and wine is a wonderful way to reset your palate and get your enthusiasm back especially at this time of year. I mean who doesn't love festive wine turning up on your doorstep? That's pretty cool. Enter today's sponsor, Bright Cellars. Bright Cellars allows you to get wines from all over the world sent directly to your doorstep. And even better, those wines are specifically curated for your preferences. So all you need to do is take a quick seven question quiz that asks you questions about your own personal taste preferences and experience preferences. And that allows Bright Cellars to curate the wines and send what you're specifically into. 
When the wine does turn up, each bottle comes with an educational card which helps you look for specific tasting notes and suggest specific food pairings, which is pretty freaking cool for the holidays. So if you want to order for yourself or get a gift card for that special super human being in your life, Bright Sellers is offering still at viewers 50% off their first box of wine. That's $45 for six bottles of wine, which is pretty awesome. Use the code in the description down below to take your seven question quiz and get started today. And may your holidays be merry and bright. Sellers. So if you followed along this far, you have successfully gelatinized all of your grain, which basically means we've made the starch available to the enzymes in the liquid. But what we haven't done yet has really added the enzymes. I know we use some, but they're probably denatured by now. So check the temperature that the enzymes you have work at. And the stuff you're specifically looking for is high temperature alpha amylase or HTA. Your specific HTA might work in a different temperature range than mine, so adjust accordingly if needed. Uh, mine works from 90 degrees Celsius up to 97 degrees Celsius, so you're going to want to check the temperature of all of the grain sitting in your fermenter. You shouldn't have seen much temperature drop at all. Uh, mine was sitting at 94 degrees Celsius, and I decided to add a little bit more boiling water in as well, just to thin it slightly and to bump the temperature ever so slightly. Now it's time to add your HTA enzymes into the pot at the specific dosage rate suggested on your HTA's data sheet. Give it a really good mix, pop the lid back on it, insulate the bejesus out of again, and let it sit for two hours. After two hours, you can pop the top, and uh, if you want to, you can use a iodine test to see if the starch has in fact been converted. At two hours, mine was fine. Now we have an interesting decision to make. Do we? Or do we not add sugar? At this point, my gravity was sitting at 1.051, which to be fair was a little bit, a little bit on the low side for me. So I decided to add uh, three kilos of sugar and bring it up to 1.071. That's going to bring me more in line with something, something roughly like 10 to 13 percent, depending on exactly how dry this ferments out. Speaking of fermenting out dry, we have used the high temperature alpha amylase to break the large starch molecules down into shorter sugar molecules. But what we haven't done is ensured that all of those sugars are actually small enough chains to be fermentable by the yeast. So we're gonna cool everything down below 65 degrees Celsius and add in our glucoamylase. This is going to further cut down those chains uh, and make sure that pretty much everything is going to be fermentable in this wash. It should ferment out insanely dry. The stuff that I have works between 35 degrees Celsius and 65 degrees Celsius, but it does take quite a long time to work. Uh, so once again, I insulated it and left it overnight. In the morning, it's time to get things down to pitching temperature, and I am going to be pitching at 30 degrees Celsius this time. Now you could just pop the top and give it a stir every now and again, let it cool down itself. Uh, I was acting a little bit impatient today, and I wanted to get it down to temperature and get my yeast in there. So I decided to use a wort chiller. This thing is grossly undersized for a wash this big, uh, but it did do the job. After about 45 minutes, it got the temperature down to 30 degrees Celsius, and it was time to pitch the yeast. So, like I said earlier on, pitching temp for me in this recipe was 30 degrees Celsius. I temperature controlled these things throughout the fermentation to 30 degrees uh, with the STC 1000 and a space saver heater. And I pitched 40 grams of AG1 Angel yeast. This stuff took off really quickly. It was fermenting vigorously within about six hours uh, and things got pretty intense and it formed a really gnarly uh, grain cap that just kept on rising and rising. So I did knock that thing down, I think three or four times over the course of the first three days. It fermented out super dry in five days. I turned the heat off, left it for another two days to let the grain settle down to make things a little bit easier for us and got stuck into distillation. Now, I know there's probably a bunch of you that are really keen to hear about and see uh, the eight plates in action, but that's not what I did first. First, I ran Two stripping runs, both at about probably 40 liters each. Just a standard stripping run for both of those. Uh, I did leave sight glasses on the column without plates just to see if I was going to have a puke at any point in time. A knob of butter helped me out there and I didn't have any problems at all. 
Now, uh, obviously we fermented this stuff on the grain, so I had to get it separated from the grain into relatively clear liquid because this thing has exposed elements. And the way I did that is, first of all, let it sit for two days. So everything, the grain settled out, and you can just scoop pretty much clear liquid off the top. And I got 40 liters off the top without having to do almost anything. That was the first stripping run. The second stripping run was pretty freaking thick. Uh, and I decided to try a different technique for this. So I've got a pot with basically a giant sieve in it. If you're wondering, this is a claw hammer all grain setup. So I just scooped all of the slops into that basically giant sieve, let it drain out for about 10 minutes, uh, and then use the pot that I was scooping with to fairly vigorously and quite powerfully press it down uh, into the sieve letting all of the liquid drain out. And then after that, I let it sit for another five minutes before you know ditching the grain and going again. Yeah, it does take a little bit of time. No, it's probably not entirely efficient, but I mean, it's easy to get through and you can do it while the other stripping runs running, right? So really, there's no wasted time. So the still was then set up with the eight plates. No, I don't have eight plates of my own. So thank you to James, who lent me all of the shiny copper looking ones. I very much appreciate it, dude. Uh, so all of the low wines, which is about maybe 14 liters of low wines, went back into the still, along with a, a small amount of the original wash that didn't make it into the stripping runs. There was maybe 15 liters of that went into the pot as well. Uh, and we started up the run. I ran it in full reflux for about 15 minutes, at which point I slowly, slowly started bleeding the heads off. I took 250 mils of four shots and put those straight in into the fire lighter bottle. Then I took one liter of heads and put those straight into the faints bottle. And then I started using the rolling cuts jars to just figure out exactly where I wanted to make the cut from heads into hearts. And I wanted to be conservative with this. Like I said at the beginning, the idea was to lift my vodka game, not go after to volume. I increased the speed again for hearts to a steady trickle and ran out for some time. I had a hunch I was gonna be collecting somewhere between maybe four and six liters of hearts for this. So when I got to the three and a half liter mark, I was watching the still really, really closely and tasting often to make sure that it wasn't getting into tails. And I was watching the sight glasses for any sign of, uh, of any of them fogging up. If you don't know guys on things like this, uh, the sight glass is fogging, especially the ones down the bottom, is a pretty good indicator that tails is coming sometime soon. So once again, at that point, I switched to the rolling cuts jars. It just means I don't have to do everything into jars, but there's no risk of me tainting the pure hearts with something nasty. And I get a bit more time to make decisions. In the end, I collected slightly under five liters of 95% alcohol as hearts, and then everything else just went back into the faints jar. All right, guys, it is the time of the show where I need to let you know what the stuff turned out like. Uh, so I've got four liters of the stuff pure straight off the still sitting here. I have yet to decide exactly what to do with this and how to store it, uh, but I did take a liter and proof it down to 40% ABV, which gave me uh, two and a bit bottles. Now, I have a, uh, a frozen shot glass here because if I am just drinking vodka straight, Quite often I like it quite cold, it's nice like that, but let's have some uh, some warm as well. I don't know why I'm pouring two full shots because, let's face it, I need to be productive for the rest of the day. That's fine. Anyway, before we taste this, a huge, huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, Patreons, for letting me do this kind of thing. Uh, I love you for it, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Uh, if you're watching these videos and you're finding value in them and you would like to help contribute to the channel, you can go to Chase the Craft dot com slash support to find out all the different ways you can help out. Uh, some of them are just free, completely free. Being a choice person that helps promote the channel, you can pick up some merch if you so desire, or if it's right for you, sign up for Patreon. Anyway, let's go with the cold one first because it's kind of warm here today and it's warming up quickly. That's not all that cold. It's cool, but not cold. This is definitely the best vodka I've ever made, by far. I think the main reason it's better than some of the other stuff I've made, uh, the FFV was probably my second favorite out of everything. Uh, but I think the main reason I'm enjoying it is that the cuts are probably slightly better or more uh, aggressive. I, I left more behind in the faints jars than I have in other, other runs. Uh, but there is also an interesting sweetness that comes through. There's a softness in the mouth and a, a soft, subtle sweetness that's coming through that's really nice. There is one downside. 
one drawback and that that is that there is a very very slight bitterness just a little bit actually no it's not bitterness i think maybe it's astringency somewhere in between uh, and i have heard from a bunch of different people that i respect that you need to be careful with barley uh, especially whole barley like with the the husk and boiling it getting it right up to 100 degrees celsius because it can go this direction whether or not it's that that i'm tasting and sensing i don't know couldn't tell you it could well be though it could be <laughs> that slight bitter astringency does detract from the overall enjoyment of the vodka it is less present in the colder version so there's that i think if i froze this right down to you know freezer temperatures like keep the bottle in the freezer i don't think i'd really even notice it i don't know but is that cheating is that not cheating i don't know <laughs> here's the thing though guys i am still getting some flavor there is still some flavor coming through with eight plates uh, all of the vodkas that I've tasted that have been just totally clean have come off either packing, entirely packed columns, uh, actually I think SPP for some of them as well, or uh, columns that have maybe six plates and then packing as well. So I still don't know quite what the deal is with plates, but they, they let flavor through. They, they let more flavor through and to be fair guys let, let's be honest eight plates isn't a whole lot you know like if i was starting a vodka distillery <laughs> you know and i was wanting to be manufacturing vodka i would be putting a buttload more plates onto my still that's just the way it is eight's not that many uh, so overall guys i'm very very happy with this uh, i'm happy with the way it's turned out i'm happy funnily enough i'm happy that there is room for improvement what would i do to improve that uh, I would want to experiment with a packed column, maybe <clears throat> maybe uh, 500 mils or 600 mils of packed column above, say, six plates. Uh, I would also want to experiment with perhaps using malted barley so I could do them at two different temperatures, go hot with the wheat and not so hot with the barley. The reason I had to do it like this with this barley is that it was not malted and my enzymes work at 90 plus degrees, so I had to get the barley that hot. That's something to, to think about as well. Or perhaps just switch it right out. Use a different grain. Um, maybe do corn and wheat. I don't know. That's up to you guys. I'd love to see what you end up experimenting with or what you've already experimented with. Let us know in the comment section down below. In any case, guys, if you enjoyed this video, please, please give it a thumbs up. That helps me out a whole lot. And if you're watching these videos and enjoying them, hit the subscribe button down below, ring the notification bell so you can see more of them. That'd be awesome. And, and keep on chasing the craft, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.